think tech life and the law this morning on a given Wednesday and what a, what an esteemed crowd we have here. We have uh, Judge Walter Kuramitsu, uh, we have Dean Avi Seufer, and we have Chuck Crumpton, a practicing and activist kind of lawyer, a lawyer who mm, talks about national issues. And uh, so, we, and we had we spent a little time negotiating what the sequence of discussion was, and I think we came to a conclusion. Uh, but I'm going to let Chuck tell you exactly what that sequence is and the scope of the discussion today uh, about the independent judiciary. Thanks, Jay. One quick correction. I stopped doing civil litigation six years ago. I only do out-of-court mediation arbitration, including by Zoom. I've done two in the last week, and I love it. Um, you How can come I was not fully advised of this? Right. So Walter's going to start us off with his action plan and its components and how that's progressing. Uh, I'll follow up in the second batting spot and, and try and move him and the topic up and then hand it over to Avi, who's going to talk to us about what's going on in the legal forum and the judiciary that should raise serious concerns and does. Okay, and questions are permitted uh, and we're gonna mix it up. But Walter, why don't you start? I know you've been thinking about this since the last show. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, Jay. Um, let me just start with by saying that um, there is a, a paraphrase of a statement from a colleague of mine from University of Hawaii, uh, which kind of appropriately uh, puts our endeavors in a, in, a, in, a, in a proper context. And she said something like this, the real purpose of our advocacy is to serve as a catalyst for change, changing the landscape so we are no longer bystanders and gossipers about judicial independence, but we are taking action. In that context, um, uh, with the Chuck and Avi's advice and counsel, we started an action plan uh, and with the idea that we need to take action. And the end goal is like, obviously, again, to preserve and strengthen judicial independence, impartiality, and integrity, both at the state and federal levels. And our call to action is initially to establish a task force, a small task force, and perhaps an advisory board to work on the following points of emphasis. And that would be one, to express our voice and have recognized institutions to express the voice of judicial independence. Uh, we started that voice with uh, contacting organizations. Uh, we contacted the American Judicature Society, the American Board of Trial Advocates, the Hawaii State Bar Association. Uh, we plan to contact the Hawaii Women Lawyers Association, American College of Trial Lawyers, and similar organizations who should be concerned and who should be very active in preserving judicial independence. In fact, last week, there was an article uh, from the uh, president of the American Board of Trial Advocates, the national president, uh, a gentleman by the name of Luther Batiste, uh, and he's currently the president, and he had a statement to the members membership of the American Board of Trial Advocates titled, Misplaced Criticism of a Judge in the Wake of COVID-19 Orders, and that happened or arose out of a case in Texas, in Dallas, basically where the judge upheld the governor's uh, COVID restrictions and the governor overturned the judge's uh, se sentence or decision. And the attorney general of the state highly criticized the judge for enforcing what the judge, what the governor initially ordered. And so basically the national president said, this kind of criticism of the judge uh, is out of order and that impedes on judicial independence and integrity. So Aboda has already stepped to the plate 
we need to get the other organizations to join us. And the other areas briefly are to educate the younger generation of the importance of judicial in in independence and integrity. And Avi has taken the lead with the University of Hawaii Law School to make sure that in the constitutional law taught that we emphasize the importance and significance of judicial independence. Third area is elections, to advocate for the election of charismatic leaders of conscience, character, and courage. This is Chuck Compton's three C's. And the fourth area is to advocate for selection of quality judges, both at the federal and state levels, who respect the rule of law, separation of powers, and judicial precedent, legal precedent, and independence. The final area is what Jay had previously emphasized, that we need social media. We need to establish a social media network to effectively pursue our goals. That's basically our action plan, Jay, and I'll have uh, Chuck and um, Avi hit me out of the ballpark. <laughs> <clears throat> so, Avi, how much of what Walter said do you agree with? Seventy-eight point six. I think we go to Chuck now. Oh, okay. Let's go to Chuck. <laughs> okay. So now that Walter has established an action plan and direction, then let's look at where there's cause for concern, where there's need, where we need to really jump in, roll up our sleeves and start to get into the trenches and do the work and do the 60s struggle, the fights. For example, in Wisconsin, the Wisconsin Supreme Court struck down the governor's COVID restrictions, stay at home order issued by his secretary of state. And the very radical right uh, justice who wrote a concurring opinion basically accused it of overstepping on First Amendment rights. <clears throat> Why a justice who's supposed to be impartial and protective of the people and recognize the executive emergency powers of the governor <clears throat> would come out with a very politicized, polarized position that essentially instigates those same people that are out demonstrating against the measures, the COVID restrictions that have proven successful, not only in Hawaii, but in many jurisdictions. A rural judge in Oregon struck down that governor's order. In Wisconsin, the response to the Wisconsin Supreme Court ruling was that the counties and cities have their own right to impose their own orders. Immediately in Madison, Dane County and 17 other counties, they imposed those stay at home orders to step in and fill that gap for the protection of the citizens. The Oregon governor has already appealed that rural judge's ruling against the restrictions in Oregon. In North Carolina, a judge who's waiting to issue his ruling Friday has announced basically what it's gonna be. He's going to do that same thing, strike down COVID restriction orders as <clears throat> intruding on civil rights. Why those civil rights of expression would override health concerns in this pandemic has not been explained by any of those courts, just the conclusion, which is very political, very polarized. Avi, what happens next? <laughs> well, what happens next is that I think we have to pay close attention uh, to what is argued in these cases and what the judges decide. And it is, I think, surprising, as Chuck just pointed out, that some of these judges just take it upon themselves to say, in very broad terms, oh, the governor can't do that. So I want to set the stage a little bit uh, for what the emergency law is in constitutional terms. And it may go too far, but the fact is that the emergency powers of the executive are very broad. And the United States Supreme Court has said that 
for over a century. The leading early case in 1905 was about a quarantine, as a matter of fact, but also about smallpox vaccinations. And in the case called Jacobson versus Massachusetts, uh, the United States Supreme Court said, well, you can, in fact, require adults to have the vaccination. Um, and that's the police power of the state. There are cases that say the war power extends for years after the war is over in terms of rent control, for example, also in the US Supreme Court. Uh, that's not to say that there aren't First Amendment counter arguments. And there's a very interesting and I think uh, astute argue, ar article yesterday by Floyd Abrams and John Langford in the New York Times saying, hey, governors, don't just say you can't have any demonstrations. You can't do that. Don't say you can't have any gatherings. You can't do that. But you can say you have to stay six feet apart or whatever the health requirements are. So there's a counter First Amendment claim. And there's an interesting federal district court decision about 10 days ago in California, where the federal judge was faced with someone who's a, a gun rights activist who said, uh, the backup is so bad in terms of background checks that I have to go to the Capitol and protest with my folks. Uh, and then there was a politician who said, I want to go to the Capitol and protest uh, because I want to run, I'm running for Congress. And they asked for a temporary restraining order. And the judge said, you don't get one. You haven't shown that you're likely to win. With a more precise challenge, they might have gotten somewhere. So the law is often, some say always, about balance, about arguments on both sides. But what has been happening and that what Chuck and, and Walter were talking about was people who are making devils out of the judges and the judges have to sort it out. And it's often very fact specific, uh, as in the cases I think that I just talked about. I can also say that it's very important, I believe, to criticize the court. And a very uh, contemporary decision, which I find uh, really astonishingly bad, is by the United States Supreme Court in Trump versus Hawaii. Uh, that was upholding the travel ban. And the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Roberts, wrote for the majority. Uh, and he said, all the government has to do is show that there's a rational basis for the ban. Well, it's not hard for the, anybody to come up with a rational basis. Uh, but that was a very important civil liberties and civil rights case where, oh, sure, they can come up with a rational basis, but did not take seriously how much that case was like the internment case, like Korematsu, which upheld national security without looking into it. And we now know uh, through the work of Eric Yamamoto and others that the Solicitor General of the United States lied to the Supreme Court because they already knew that there was no security threat. And yet they made that argument. And a subsequent uh, acting Solicitor General actually apologized uh, in more recent times. Nonetheless, Justice Sotomayor says in dissent, this is Korematsu. And basically, Robert says, no, it isn't without really explaining why not. Uh, so you have to be, I think, very careful about uh, granting that there are broad emergency powers. You have to say, well, are they really needed and are they actually focused uh, as opposed to there can be no demonstrations. On the other hand, constitutional law says uh, that emergency powers can go very far if there really is an emergency. Hmm. The jury has a question. <clears throat> the question is, um, you know, we live in strange times, and not only because of COVID, but because of Trump. Trump, who criticizes judges, the president who criticizes judges. Worse than that, in criticizing judges, he, he actually, um, he does command influence on them, as he does in the military, trying to control judicial, you know, officials all over the country that way, federal judges, but also state judges. Uh, and I think the, the judge these days has new, new, new influences on him because it's not only Trump. Trump sets things in motion and other people follow. Some of those judges who have ruled badly um, are ruling not because Trump called them on the phone at 11 o'clock one night, but because you know, they want to please him. They want to please his constituents. They want to please um, you know, people in the red states. Uh, they want to have more of a future politically or judicially. <clears throat> and so this is all politicized, isn't it, Avi? It sounds like, you know, everything that has happened here can be tagged on some political process that is very special in our time, isn't it? Well, I think your point about uh, Trump is a crucial point. It has never been the case until now 
that a president would have the temerity, the chutzpah, to go after judges as he has. And he's gone after them because of their backgrounds. Uh, in one case, of course, he thought someone was un-American who uh, was born, born in the United States, uh, but that was a minority person. And so he went after that judge and he's constantly going after people. And he does it, of course, in a bullying kind of way. No president has ever done that. It's not to say the presidents have agreed. And FDR was famous for uh, some of his characterizations of the court when they were overruling New Deal uh, legislation. But he did it in a very sophisticated way. He didn't do it sort of judge by judge. So we are in a time where people don't understand, and this gets back to Walter's point, the importance of the independence of judges. Uh, and we want judges to sort out the facts, to think about the law, and not just say, this is what the public wants. Uh, and that apparently is what Trump wants judges to do. And it's absolutely not what should be done. It's also striking these days that the Attorney General of the United States is so politicized and so willing to do unprecedented things, apparently because he thinks it is what the president wants, or perhaps they've agreed it is what the president wants. Uh, so uh, trying to get those guilty pleas overturned by a judge is really quite an amazing thing. Now, the judge may stand up to that, uh, and that is a good thing. That's judicial independence which isn't to say judges are always right. But we have a system where the trial judge decides and there's usually a review of that. And so we have a lot of people who actually think about it and write about it. And there's something about writing about it that makes you think hard. Uh, so there are opinions that don't write and justices famously change their views when they try to write a majority opinion and wind up dissenting. So you think hard about something and now we have this system of review, appellate review, uh, and I think that's a great value. And it's one that's been recognized in Hawaii from the start. Uh, the, one of the best places to look for that source is in the second issue, second law review uh, volume, uh, Chief Justice Richardson wrote an essay which was largely about the importance of judicial independence, in part because he was very much involved with the Conference of Chief Justices around the country. And he would bring them lay, he was a favorite, uh, of those chief justices, but they talked about and they tried to follow judicial independence. Well, you know, Walter, aren't there, there are two um, parties to the transaction here? One is the judge. He must have an ethic of independence. He must be able to um, do the right thing according to everything that he knows uh, and has learned and has experienced. Um, and and we, want, we want to encourage him, your task force, wants to encourage him to be independent. On the other hand, there are people out there who would like to undermine that independence. They would like to lobby judges and influence judges and bully judges and threaten judges and criticism on, uh, criti criticize them on the basis of race, color, creed, whatever, because of a, a, a decision they, they've made or, or they may make. Um, so your task force should look at both ends of it, right? Not only the judge, those people who inappropriately attempt to influence the judge. Am I right? That's exactly right because like I always said, you know, it's not it's not negative or uh, it's not that we want to discourage any dissent of any judicial opinions or uh, decisions, but if the criticism goes overboard and starts to um, go after the judge personally, and the judge, by ethics, is not able to respond to any reasons for his decision, et cetera, et cetera. However, the criticism has to have some limitation and restraint. And that's where we come in, that we have to have a, at least define the limits of criticism and the limits of resistance. And, uh, and that's where I think initially it's important to select quality judges. The Hawaii state has the uh, system of uh, recommending judges to the Judicial Selection Commission and the U New York University uh, Brennan School of uh, Justice uh, basically said Hawaii has a very efficient sound selection process and we're the only state in the union that selects and retains judges by the decision of the Judicial Commission. And so from 
that selection process, we've been able to select quality judges who respects precedent, who respects the law or the rule of law. And however, the citizens have a right to criticize decisions, but there must be some limitations posed on those uh, criticisms. They cannot go into the area of personal attacks like President Trump in the case of Judge Curiel in Southern California, you know, accused him of being wrong because he's a Mexican. He's not a Mexican. He's a U.S. citizen of, of Mexican ancestry. But, you know, Trump, Trump just criticized on a personal attack level, which was false. That kind of resistance we must strike down. And so you're exactly right, Jay. We have to pr pr provide boundaries. We have to make uh, define the limits of criticism so that we can preserve the judicial independence. That's what we're all about. Now, you know who benefits from all of this? Everybody, all of the citizens, because a lot of the people impacted by this, when they have a independent judiciary, the public and the citizens can be assured of safety. They can be assured of good health. They can be assured of honesty and integrity in their everyday life. So the beneficiaries of all what we are doing are gonna be the actual people of our United States. You know, one thing you mentioned I think is really pertinent is the judge by ethics is, he can't come out and defend himself. You're not going to see an op-ed piece by, um, you know, by a sitting judge saying, I, I've been inappropriately criticized here by the president, or I've been inappropriately uh, influenced, or somebody has inappropriately attempted to influence me. You know, you're not going to see that op-ed piece. So it falls to somebody else to stand up and defend him. I hope your task force looks into that. And, and who would that be? Would it be a journalist? I think a lot of journalists don't really understand the issue we're talking about. And I think they, you know, they tend to report in the old journalistic style of just the facts. Um, they, they don't necessarily, some columnists do, but they don't necessarily say this is an outrage and a violation of our system. And it, uh, it tears at the fabric of our constitution for you to do this. Uh, so the question really is who should speak here? Who should be the active one? Should it be the law schools, Avi? Should the law review include an article that directly, you know, re, re, you know, argues against some one individual attempting to influence or criticize the judge inappropriately? Is that in, is that in the in the wheelhouse of the law schools? So, Jay, how many pages do you think you need to write that article? <laughs> you don't even have to put in many footnotes. <laughs> Okay, if I may, one thought. The judges themselves have access to people who can stand up for those values and principles. Federal Judge Emmett Sullivan in the Michael Flynn case, in a case in which the prosecution wants Attorney General Barr at President Trump's direction, told his prosecutors to drop the case, and most of them quit in response to that order. But Whoever was left went ahead and filed a motion to dismiss the charges. Of course, the only other party, the defendant, Flynn, is not going to oppose it. So you figure it's slam dunk, right? Wrong, Buzz. Thank you for playing. Judge Emmett Sullivan stepped up and he did two things. Number one, he invited amicus curiae briefs and responses from the people who would protect judicial independence, integrity, and impartiality and manipulation of the system. And he appointed a former prosecutor, former judge from Missouri to respond to that motion to dismiss. So there are resources available within the legal system that we as people can support and encourage. And Judge Sullivan's example, I think is a brilliant one and one that should be taken and followed. I'd love yeah. to see that happen. In great to places. have that happen all over town. Yeah, that's a great mechanism. By the way, you guys, uh, when when the Judge Sullivan uh, asked for amicus briefs uh, in that case from the from the bar from the public, my brother immediately filed one. 
<laughs> or it is in the process. I'm not sure if it's actually filed, but um, he prepared one. So it's a great, that's a great mechanism. And maybe that's the, the mechanism of the future. Well, if maybe has... you and he should publish that amicus brief with a few footnotes in the law <laughs> review. Right. You mean in the law review? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so what does it look like for the task force now, Walter? Where are we going with this? What kind of uh, feedback do you expect? What kind of action report, um, you know, statement do you expect? Yeah, right now, I'm working on uh, uh, starting off with a mission statement that would have clarity and purpose and effectiveness. And then I'm trying to put together a small task force with an advisory board. And the key point now is to find the appropriate people, like you said, should we include a journalist or should we include a judge? You know, and so certain judges don't want to participate because they're not allowed by their code of ethics to voice any kind of resistance on their part. So we have to speak for the judges. And so I'm working on getting the uh, task force uh, set up now. Uh, we've contacted a BOTA, uh, American Board of Trial Advocates. They've disseminated all of our Think Tech Hawaii programs to the membership. So we're waiting for a comment or feedback from them. We have involved the um, uh, American Judicature Society as well as the Hawaii Bar. But also, uh, Jay, we have also contacted the um, high schools of the, public, the Department of Education as well as the private schools because let us not forget our audience is not only the law students, but it's the younger generation of high school students who are coming up the ranks, they should know the importance of judicial independence. So we're waiting for feedback from the DOE as well as the Association of Private Schools. So we're working on this task force and once we get this together, we're gonna to start moving ahead. And that's where uh, Avi and Chuck are, have, are going to have to work very hard. And, and if you wanna volunteer, you'll be right there with us. <laughs> So, I mean, this is really a perfect opportunity for the law school in the, in the what do you want to say, the post-COVID world, uh, a world where democracy has been, uh, you know, offended, uh, damaged maybe, uh, and we have to restore it. It doesn't restore automatically. You have to take affirmative action to restore the damage, and, and maybe the law school in the, in the new post-COVID world could include this sort of thing as a regular matter. What do you think? Well, one of the things... Uh that I have to make clear is that the law school is not a unified uh, entity and I don't speak for the law school, I speak for myself, but the law school is full of people who are involved with the community uh, and speaking out. That's what our professors do and many of our students do as well. And uh, we're very active and I would say uh, quite important, of course, I would say it uh, to the state of Hawaii, but this is something that we are going to be talking about for a long time. Uh, it is the essence in some ways of the law school to talk about what exists and what ought to exist. And law, as my late friend Bob Cover famously said, is the bridge between is and ought. So we're always <laughs> worrying about what ought to be. Uh, not just looking back, it's telling contemporary stories and then trying to improve things. And I think our law school, a bunch of individuals who have very different opinions often, uh, but committed to that, committed to trying to improve the world. You know, one of the things that uh, we talked about, uh, not only with Michael Bruno, um, uh, but with Vasilis uh, 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 Sirmos recently, is the notion that the university would, would now has the power to do greater outreach with, with Zoom and uh, remote, you know, remote connection. <clears throat> and so I think there are a lot of people out there uh, would like to be connected, would like to participate uh, on an outreach basis using Zoom. That's that's another thing in the post-COVID world. You know. <laughs> yeah. We have a proposal, which I think uh, we ought to brush off. It's a couple of years ago and we didn't get funding for it. <clears throat> but it, the idea was that uh, people in the DOE, the state DOE, <clears throat> administrators and teachers are confronting law all the time on a daily basis, but they don't have much training in it. So we ought to have a certificate uh, through Zoom, perhaps, uh, or whatever online uh, improvement on Zoom. And 
that would probably help them in their daily lives. Maybe it would help them with their salaries. And they have to wrestle with these issues uh, without understanding the legal context, which is everywhere. Yeah, well, that's, that's a great idea. We all have to spend more time at the law school, whether in person yeah. or, or, by, or by Zoom. So uh, Chuck, it's your turn since we're out of time uh, to summarize this discussion. Tell us where we have gone since the last discussion and where we are going now. I think Walter and Avi put it really well in a sentence. We are connecting the people who have that conscience, courage, and character on this issue to work together, to speak together, and to assert those values. That's it. It's <laughs> 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 still of time, right? And and Turkey is going to be the chairman on that uh, tr three C's. <laughs> that won't happen. Don't forget the three C's. Well, thank you, Chuck. Thank you for putting this together. Thank you, Walter. Thank you for coming around. And oh, thank my... you for following through, you know. I always say there's two kinds of people in the world. One, one kind of people is the follow-through people. And the second kind is the others. Oh, <laughs> all right. All right. We are follow-throughers. That's right. And thank that's you why your fastball that. still has some mustard on it, Jay. You follow through. <laughs> Mustard, it must be the Boston Red Sox, eh? <laughs> Thank you, Avi. Thank you for coming down. Thank you all. It's been a great discussion. I hope we can do it again soon. Have a great day. Thanks for making this day. possible. Aloha.